few weeks ago, where all the dormant bank accounts uh, across all the banks in England were swept together in a big pot. Um, the big four banks put another £50 million in, and I think there's £700 million sitting in a, an investment fund. Um, and big society capital may also be a source of funding for these sorts of projects. EIS and SEIS funds, these are two tax schemes that the government is currently running that allows, it's linked with the community share offer type approach typically, where individuals can invest money in shares into small businesses and they get quite strong tax relief if they leave the money in there for a period of time. And that could be, that's proving to be quite a popular approach. We've seen um, quite a few of the first round bids looking to use that as a sort of tax efficient way of encouraging the high net worths to come and invest in their broadband. And you can think of others, I mean, that's not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of the sorts of things that you can use to, to get that. <coughs> there are some resources. We'll make this presentation available so that you don't have to copy down those meaningless um, URLs at the end of it. There's a number of sources of advice out there. Big UK and DEFRA together are trying to collect some more. You worked on a template business case and um, that's going to be made available along with some other sources of information. So that list will get longer but we'll make sure that they're signposted to you. The next bit is start to go through how communities typically think about converting from a campaign into a project that's actually going to deliver something. I'm sure Chris and uh, we're going to talk about this afterwards anyway, I'll, get expect, but I'll cover it from our point of view. These are the sorts of typical stages a project has to go through to deliver a broadband project from establishing, thinking about the demographic analysis, who's, where the demand is, what your broadband landscape looks like, doing the business plan and so on like that, to the point where at some point somebody actually puts a spade in the ground and starts building. That's the point at which you would typically put an expression of interest in um, to the community broadband fund. When you've decided you really think you want to do something, you've got a committee thinking about it, you've done some initial analysis that says, actually, as a wider area, we do have a genuine problem and we do have an appetite for a better solution than just basic broadband. And we, we think we want to do it. And you can define exactly what the area is, and what the exact geography is that you want to cover. If your expression of interest is accepted, the point at which you submit your full plan to, to DEFRA would be once you've completed your formal, old-fashioned business plan. Um, some things to think about when you're looking at this. Uh, when you look at projects that have happened all around, you know, the, the, these community-based broadband projects, they, they exist all across America and all across Europe. It's quite a popular model uh, internationally. And you learn different things from talking to different projects. This chap, uh, a Dutchman, Case Rovers, uh, he has quite a neat way of describing the success factors of these types of projects. In fact, potentially any sort of broadband project. And he has what he calls his seven pillars. But some of them are kind of obvious. You need a, a solid business plan and a reliable network. Um, but the thing to take away from this is that actually only one of these is technical. And the single biggest problem that community projects fall into is thinking this is a technical problem. Once you've done all the other stuff, the technology falls out of the bottom. The technology is the last thing, actually, most projects should be thinking about. It's more about the engagement, getting people involved. So, over half of these pillars actually relate to your community and have nothing to do with technology. They're about your communications, what types of services your local communities actually want to use, how you look after your community, how you communicate with them and giving them a sense of what the Dutch call an us feeling, a sense that actually in some tangible way the community are involved and own this project in some way. Another thing to sort of re-emphasise this technology piece is, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, it's a diffusion of ideas thing, the stages of which 
uh, markets develop, the types of people who are attracted. And you notice that, you know, it starts off with the innovators and the early adopters. Well, the early adopters are the people who queue outside an Apple store to buy an iPad 3 when they've also already got a perfectly serviceable iPad 2. But that's the only space where speed sells. So if your only message is, I've got 100 meg, or 1,000 megabits, or whatever it may be, you're unlikely to get much beyond about perhaps 20% take-up. Everybody else needs to think about services and engagement, you know, things that actually affect people's lives in some way, something meaningful. For the early majority, that may be um, media, you know, Netflix, love films, those kinds of things, maybe some games. But the more you get up this sort of way, the more it starts turning into public services. And if, if you're going to deliver a broadband service into the very most rural areas, you need to get as much take up as you can possibly get. So the more you can think about delivering transform public services, for example, helping out with education platforms, you know, helping out with health care, all those sorts of things, the more likely your project is going to be sustainable and uh, actually reach a point where um, you've got sufficient people engaged in it that it's, it's going to hang around. Final few set of bits. What we've done to try and help as well is we've come up with five, technically six, broad um, business models, if you like, for approaching this sort of problem. So you're not just stuck between give the money to BT and um, dig it myself. You know, that there are choices in there. So technically, there is a do nothing option, and if you do do nothing at the end of this, you know, thinking about this, you're still going to see improved broadband through the county plan. The next one is what's called demand aggregation. So this is a solution that will typically work <coughs> when your community is perhaps in the 91st, 92nd, 93rd percentile. So just beyond where your county plan would naturally deliver superfast services. And this is where the community are prepared to go out and do more than just put their hand up and say, I might vaguely like some better broadband services if somebody were to build it for me, maybe. This is about actually signing some sort of pledge to say, if somebody builds this, I will buy a minimum service as a line rental or whatever it may be. And that helps produce a sort of a level of certainty that the demand is actually real. Um, to give you an idea where this, you know, where this can go, I, I know that at least one of the BT Race to Infinity winners had over 110% demand. Um, that there were far more people registering their demand for uh, BT's Infinity service in some of those communities than there were houses, and there had ever been houses. Um, you can't build a business case on that. So that, you know, these do actually need to be sort of things that you could convert into an order with some certainty. The upside is there's no real additional cost to the community. And you stand a reasonable chance, if you're in the 91st, 92nd type percentiles, of getting super fast broadband. The downside is, potentially, is that you have no control over the solution. Whatever the county plan delivers is what you will get. You, don't, you can't really influence that. And there is always a risk that if you're in the 94th, 5th, 6th or 7th percentile, that you might not get super fast broadband. The, 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 um, the chosen uh, partner of the county council might turn around <coughs> and say, well, actually that area is so difficult, even if they got 99% of the community signed up, we still couldn't afford to do a solution there. So there is that risk. The next is build a benefit. Now, I have to be honest, this is, this is a model that divides opinion quite harshly between communities. Um, basically, the community is willing to actually more practically assist than just signing an order. So they might be prepared to do the civil engineering. You might have farmers who've got trenching equipment, for example. They, you may have people willing to waive way leave rights to help reduce the cost of delivering it across the land. Or they may be able to put additional funding in. But, in this particular model, the community is prepared to accept that their return on investment from that 
equity is purely um, from being able to receive a service they wouldn't have otherwise got. So essentially, you're going to put a chunk of effort in to um, help whoever it is that the county council will procure to deliver a service. Um, that we've tended to find, if the level of commitment is one or two hundred pounds type of additional effort, then this model can be quite a nice way of just making the problem go away. Um, if it goes above that, people start to ask, well, actually, what's in it for me? And tend to want to start seeing some sort of return. So um, this can work. This, I mean, there have been communities that have signed up to this model. Uh, the upside is there's no additional risk. You're not actually being asked to run a business day to day. Um, it will deliver NGA because you're not going to dig a trench for somebody else unless you can be damn sure that it's going to deliver what we want. The downside is you may still have quite a limited say in what the solution is. The partners that um, the county councils will deliver will have a limited array of solutions that they, you, can, you can choose from. And you might find that there is significant sweat equity or even cash being put into this with no commercial return. It's not something that a private equity house would consider, for example. <coughs> After this, you're moving away from the partners that the local authority might choose. You're now getting into a community enterprise type of solution where you're now becoming responsible for doing this. So the first one is a partnership. So the community is prepared to raise some of the risk finance that's needed to deliver the project, but perhaps not all of it. Um, but, and they expect to see some sort of investment return on that commitment. Um, but you don't want to actually run a telecommunications company. So instead you put out a tender that says we're seeking a partner to design, build and operate the network. We've got this level of funding, you'll need to match the funding or whatever it may be. Um, this is the point at which you need to start realising that what you yourself are personally commissioning and owning will be national strategic infrastructure, so you need to start thinking like a business with what's your investment strategy, what is your exit strategy, and all those kinds of things. But on the upside, you may well eventually see an investment return on this project, um, just as uh, you know, a susta any sustainable business should eventually deliver an investment return. You'll be able to influence the strategy because you, you're involved day to day. And because you're commissioning it, it will deliver the service that you expect. The downside is you're starting to introduce community risk into this for the first time. So you will be responsible for um, the day-to-day -day running of this business at some level. The next is a concession where you're not just prepared to raise some of the money, you're actually prepared as a community to raise all of the money. Um, but you have no ambition to actually become a network operator, so instead what you do is you say, right, we've got all this money to build a network, um, I want someone to come in and design, build and operate it on our behalf. We own the assets, but you can run it on a day-to-day -day concession basis. Here the community, their real response to the day-to-day responsibilities that they, they may have to steer the strategic decisions, but actually most of the day-to-day um, responsibility falls to somebody else. The upside is you have a partner that can help mitigate the risk, but the final responsibility will still be yours. You have strategic control over this, and it's going to deliver the solution you want. The downside is that there is significant investment. If you're going to raise all of that money yourself, it is significant. And you are ultimately responsible, bearing in mind ultimate responsibility at some point in the future may include things like blue light 999 telephone calls, heart monitors and things like that. You know, it starts to get quite serious. It's not to say it can't be done, and it absolutely can be done. But you need to be quite conscious of what you're getting involved in. And the final one is where not only do you want to raise all the finance yourself, you actually want to build it yourself. Um, so you have to have a strong desire to become the network operator. You and the community design, to design, build, and operate your own network for yourselves. 
Um, you have to then encourage on service providers and all those sorts of things onto your network as well. <coughs> the upside is it absolutely will deliver whatever it is that you've designed. The downside is you may find that if you change your mind in the future, the exit strategy can be quite challenging because you as a community may not have a reputation that another um, company, you know, another telecommunications company, the, their level of due diligence to work out whether they actually want to buy your network may be too much for them to, to decide to come and talk to you. It can be challenging to open, to deliver open access. So by that I mean have the sort of choice of service providers and so on that the market, that customers typically want to see. Um, you know, to give you some idea, what well, an extreme case is that the, big, the biggest two or three service providers typically turn around and say that unless we can see perhaps a couple of hundred thousand customers, we're not going to talk to you. Um, you've got a heavy continuing commitment. So you're now, because you're on your own, you, you're now responsible for the call centre, so when somebody rings, you know, can't get, get onto the internet at five o'clock on a Sunday morning, that becomes your problem, they'll be ringing you. Um, and all of the risk falls on your shoulders. If the cable breaks, it's your responsibility to go and fix it. If 999 calls don't get completed in the future, that may become your responsibility and so on. So it's, it's not a decision to take on lightly. Now, after scaring the pants off you, in a moment you're going to hear from somebody who's actually doing it. Who <laughs> looks terrified at the moment, but just staring at that red block. So, what I don't want to do is sort of suggest that there is a right or wrong answer in all of this. I think for different communities, well, I don't. Sure. You're doing a very good job. <laughs> <That's pretty laughs> what I would say is that there are communities, and there's one here, who have done this. This kind of approach does take a fairly strong stomach. Does this? Yes. yes. And it isn't for everybody. And what I wanted to try and show with the models is that there is something. So if you sit there and think this is the only solution, and actually you don't feel you're quite up to it, you know, you really can't quite go for this on your own. There are other models out there, and there's someone else sat here who would probably be quite happy to come.